Um, so I'm, I'm Michael Corey. I'm a pediatric cardiologist at the Stellar Children's Hospital, uh, University of Alberta. And um, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Simon Urschel and Stephanie Dahmer uh, for an exciting presentation today. I'll start with uh, our land acknowledgement. Uh, the University of Alberta acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. I'd like to also thank Paladin for their support for the ATI seminar series, uh, and also um, alert you all that registration is now open for the ATI Research Day, uh, which is happening on May 10th. Uh, the abstract deadline is March 15th, uh, so a month from today, uh, and Diana will put the link in the chat. Uh, now. Thank you, Diana. Also a reminder that the ATI Paladin and its CDTRP Innovation Grant has been launched, and the deadline is April 12th. Uh, these are $30,000 grants each, and ATI members are eligible for six awards, uh, depending on your subject area. Uh, and more information on this is available on the CDTRP website, which again, thank you, Diana. We'll put the link in the chat. Um, Okay, so now I will uh, introduce uh, Dr. Urschel and Stephanie Dahmer. I'm sure uh, Dr. Urschel doesn't require much introduction uh, for most people on this call, but he is a pediatric cardiologist, immunologist, and director of the Pediatric Heart Transplant Program at the Stoller Children's Hospital. He received his training in pediatrics, congenital and acquired immunodeficiencies, and pediatric cardiology at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. Uh, and uh, Dr. Urschel's uh, research focuses on the Im immature immune system of the early childhood and how natural weaknesses of the immune response can improve outcomes of organ transplantation. And this work on blood group uh, incompatible heart transplantation and desensitization therapies has contributed to establish this technique as a standard option in many parts of the world, resulting in shorter wait times, better utilization of donor organs, and improved survival after heart transplantation. His second research focus is on quality of life, neurocognitive outcomes, and mental health after pediatric transplantation, which we'll hear about more today. Stephanie Dahmer is a fourth-year medical student at the University of Alberta, who is currently interviewing for residency positions in urban and rural family medicine. Stephanie is also an accomplished artist and continues to practice as an artist during her medical training. She is passionate about how art can connect people and facilitate helpful communication. Her most recent project, is a future of medicine art competition uh, for rural teenagers, which allows youth to share their perspectives on healthcare in the community and creatively promotes rural youth interest in medicine as a career. It sounds fascinating. Their talk today is entitled Innovative Communication Pathways to Help Transplant Teenagers to Transition into Adult Care Development of a Graphic Novel. Can you see my slides okay? Uh, yeah. Hear me? Okay, yeah. excellent. Thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you for the ATI for this uh, allowing me to present here today. Um, mostly introducing Stephanie's work, which has been a project that we've done a few years ago together. And um, I think it's very important. I'll just uh, quickly talk a bit about the backgrounds, and then Stephanie will take over from there. Um, I have no financial conflicts of interest. I am holding a couple of grants from various charitable and governmental institutions for which I am very grateful, including the Alberta Transplant Institute and Big Gifts for Little Lives, but no conflicts of interest. I also have to disclose that I am proud father of three teenage boys and I have no idea how to communicate with them. And oftentimes I wonder if they even speak the same language and that goes beyond me speaking German to them and them answering in English. Uh, and if you Google adolescence, you come up with these beautiful pictures of happy, friendly people that love each other and support each other. And you wonder why in the same time period, and this is data from kidney transplant, but it equally applies to pretty much every transplant, the likelihood of losing your graft is dramatically higher than any time else in life. And this is actually not a strike 19 or so thing, but it lasts from 15 to 25, even into the low 30s. And so what are the reasons for that? Um, one of them is that probably a more realistic depiction of what happens during teenage is captured in these um, images that we're doing a lot of things that, well, not me, of course, but other people do a lot of things um, that they may later 
not be as happy about and then may not always be the smartest choices. And one of the big issues for sure is non-adherence in that age group. They are emotionally challenged. They like to do a lot of risk-taking taking behaviors. They also have all the living habits and it is difficult to take your medication at eight in the morning if you're sleeping until 12. Um, they have to transition into independence, which I think is, is one of the biggest steps out of being a child and being cared for into somebody who has to take care of yourself. Um, and there's also other things that we may sometimes be a little bit unfair with their high likelihood of rejection because the alterations in drug metabolism and the hormones uh, definitely play a role in the immune response as well and in the metabolism of um, immune suppression. Now, if we look at our pediatric heart patients, we have an additional factor, which is their brain has for sure taken some injury in the whole process, starting with often underlying genetic exposure that has led to the heart not being fully normal to a very challenging, often early life course where they are on mechanical support or on lots of inotropes and quite limited. They have low cardiac output. Many of them have saturations in the 70% range for years sometimes, and they undergo surgeries and eventually the transplantation. Once they are transplanted, they face immune suppression, the chronic health effects of that. And we may think they're not bad because it's just a little bit diarrhea, but having diarrhea every day is probably not very pleasant. Uh, and they are facing severe complications such as post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease. So they have this Damocles sword hanging over them that um, puts additional stress on them. They spend quite a bit of time in hospital, which they cannot use to go undergo their normal developmental steps and have many medical appointments. For the parents, it's always a difficult balance between trying not to overprotect their children after having experienced all these significant issues and also their own possible PTSD and mental illness that they take from going through all this uh, and finding the right balance to have the strength to, to uh, support their children. And then social economic factors obviously play into all of these stages. And when we've looked a few years ago into what are the neurocognitive outcomes, it actually is reflected in their uh, neurocognitive abilities. So children overall after heart transplant have lower average IQ scores. This is at the age of four to five, but particularly those with congenital heart disease are quite a bit lower than the average. And if you look into this, uh, IQ less than 70 is actually what is used in adults to determine whether you're legally responsible for your actions and, and considered to be independent. And that was in 40% of the children the case, so, so they are facing significant challenges there. And that then again puts up an emotional kind of vicious circle because you may have a low neurocognitive performance affecting school performance, which depresses you, but also depression and anxiety, of course, affects uh, your school and neurocognitive performance. You may not be able to participate in everything you want to do and may be more isolated and that kind of all contributes to having a more difficult teenage, possibly even than the average teenager. And there is a couple of studies that have looked into that, finding up to a third of the children having uh, depression, particularly actually early post-transplant and while they're waiting for transplant, getting better later on. Behavioral problems are very common. Um, uh, ADHD, uh, I think is probably near to 50% just looking at our population, not having any specific uh, nodes there and autism spectrum disorder is definitely more common than in the general population as well. Uh, it is important to notice because it's a, a modifiable factor that family socioeconomic factors play into that. And the whole discussion around PTSD, when we did an informal survey in our parents, more than half of them would say they have PTSD themselves from what they have been through. So definitely plays into it. Um, recently, in within the Canadian uh, multi-center, uh, the Canadian National Transplant Research Program and now CDTRP, we had what's called a positive study, a pediatric arm that looked into adherence amongst other things and included 14 to 25 year old participants that had a pediatric transplantation of either kidney, liver, or heart. And I have put that up to show you that the kidney was very much overrepresented and the heart underrepresented in this cohort. So not everything you see may be, may be attributable to them. They had uh, to be at least three months after transplant and two months after hospital discharge, followed in pediatric or adult centers and 
Additionally, we got information from the nurses and medical directors on how the programs are structured. And the factors that came out to be associated with poor adherence um, was one that the, the more they had to go to blood work, actually, the more likely they were to be adherent, which is interesting and important for our planning. Also, the more time the nurse spent with them during their clinic visit was positively associated with a better adherence. In terms of patient factors, um, having received the organ from a living donor, which obviously is probably uh, often is a relative that you know, seems to motivate people to take better care of their organ. Uh, the further they are out of transplant, the worse the care gets. And that may be associated with this um, paradoxical finding that we had that the more medications they had, the more likely they were to adhere, which is a bit in contrast to what other other um, disorders report, and I think that has to do with that they get a lot of medications early on, and that's also the time when they tend to be much more diligent about it. Uh, patients that were the primary caregiver themselves also had a higher likelihood of adhering to their medication. Patients who worried a lot about side effects or the immunosuppressive therapy were less likely to take it regularly, and uh, patients with a high self-efficacy were very light, more likely to take it and so were the ones that were very satisfied with their team. Another paradoxical thing we found was that people that had a high level of trust in their team had lower likelihood of adherence. Now, this may indicate that they were just more likely to admit it or that they have the feeling, well, the transplant team can fix it all, so I don't have to do as much. We, we don't know what the exact motivation behind that is, but it was an interesting thing to notice. And adherence here was defined as taking, not missing any doses over the past four weeks, and everybody who takes chronic medication can probably rely to how difficult that is. We didn't find differences between uh, heart, liver, and kidney transplants, although it looks like the heart and liver are a little bit less active. Again, kidney transplant recipients here were older, were more likely to have taken care of themselves already, so it's probably a confounding effect. Another thing that was really interesting to see here is that by self-report, females were much more adherent than males, but not so by fluctuation of the tetronymus levels. So this may be that either they are less likely to admit to non-adherence or that there are biological factors that make the fluctuation higher in females than males, which is quite possible in terms of uh, hormone changes and things like that. Uh, Interestingly, there was no difference between care in adult or pediatric center. So the simple recipe that sometimes people want to suggest saying, oh, we just need to keep them longer in pediatric care is not necessarily a solution. Um, you can struggle. It's more kind of struggling with becoming independent, I think. So the really key message here is being adolescent is one of the highest risk factors for worse transplant outcomes, higher than being HLA mismatched or having uh, other infectious um, risk factors. So it's something we really need to focus on. And we have done that. Marie has developed very nice, our nurse practitioner, very nice kind of stepwise transition program where we start actually at the age of 10 to 11 before they become rebellious teenagers to make them responsible more for their own medication. Start with knowing them. We have several groups um, that the that group and one-on-one -on -one teaching sessions with them and we try to include uh, adolescent medicine, medicine, psychology, psychiatry as needed, and transition them stepwise into adulthood. They actually have a checklist where they need to know their medications, they need to learn how to refill their medications eventually, they need to know how to tell somebody in quick and easy words what's actually happening with them, uh, know, need to know a little bit about their, their um, disorder. We also, um, I'll talk about that in just a second. We'll, we'll try to hook them up with young adult mentors so that they have somebody to talk to about and then do a stepwise transition where we see them together with the adult team. And the last time they come to their pediatric appointment and we're lucky that they still come back to the same place then to continue seeing the adult team. Another thing that we found extremely useful is our heart transplant family camp that we've been doing since 2011. And as you can see, it has grown substantially over time and we take the whole families there and it allows them again to be paired up with mentors. And sometimes the parents of our patients may be barely older than the adult mentors uh, and relay very well to them. And we have a formal session where the adult mentors explain their things, but also lots of opportunity to just grab them on the side of the soccer field. We provide age-specific education, which again, the mentors sometimes help. 
um, to, to teach the younger ones. It allows them to grow up together. As you can see here, this is actually the same patient um, going through the years and growing up with others that are facing the same challenges. We also take it as an opportunity to help the families find back to a normal and, and notice that there's a lot of things that their kids can do and they don't have to put them into a bubble. Another initiative that we're currently evaluating is an online mentorship program that we do in a joint study with um, Toronto and where our patients in later teenage are put, put together with an adult mentor. The adult mentors have been trained on how to deal with also sensitive information that they may hear and then they're being paired up and we're currently evaluating how useful that is for our teenagers. We're including uh, more patient reported outcome measures to just be aware of some of the challenges that may not come up during a regular clinic visit. And then we were looking into how can we actually try and reach those kids better? And that's where I wanna pass on to Stephanie. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Great, I'll just share my screen as well. So my part of the seminar today, just make sure everyone can see that okay. Yeah, perfect. That? Awesome. Good. All right. So my part of the seminar today is telling you a little bit more about this project that I had the honor of being a part of. So it's the development of a graphic novel as an innovative approach to further supporting these teens with heart transplants. These are my co-authors below. Our paper was just published in Pediatric Transplantation this year, if you want to read more after I'm done today. Um, but I wanted to start by saying none of us have any conflict of interest today. Um, our project was funded by the Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation Quality Improvement Initiative grant and a U of A undergraduate research initiative stipend. Um, and the U of A painting department also graciously provided me with an art studio during the course of this project, which was extremely generous of them. So Dr. Urschel already tackled our first learning objective, discussing the challenges of adolescence, how being an adolescent is important for outcomes of solid organ transplantation. And he already explored some strategies we have in place, like the peer-to-peer -peer program, transplant camp, which is a blast. I got to go one year. Uh, but even with these initiatives, adherence to the post-transplant lifestyle remains really difficult for teens and more resources and supports are needed. So in light of all these challenges, Kind of in response, we started thinking outside of the box a little bit and decided to try and develop a new tool to try and encourage and motivate teens to take some more ownership of their health. What's interesting is some research has been emerging about the benefits of using narrative as a tool to inspire, to transfer knowledge, and to even cause changes in thinking patterns and behaviors. We started thinking about the possibility of a graphic novel. So it's age appropriate, visually appealing, this tool that combines images and words to form a narrative that's both engaging and specific. So we decided to give it a go. We knew there were some other groups who had found some success using creative approaches as well, like this smartphone app to help with adherence. And there's a group in Toronto who developed this informative website for teens with kidney transplants. Now this group in their process, they really emphasize the importance of starting by asking the target group, the teen patients, what they wanted to learn from the website. And we thought this was really important. Creating educational or clinical management tools for teens can be really vulnerable to ineffectiveness when they're just created by care providers who are relying on really valuable expertise and medical knowledge, but who might make some assumptions about what is important to their target audience. So we decided to take a similar approach to the group in Toronto, but rather than ask what patients wanted to learn, we wanted to get just a fuller picture of the experience of being a teen with a heart transplant. So we ended up interviewing a pilot group of teen heart transplant patients, their parents, and healthcare providers using a mixed approach to qualitative data collection. So standardized questionnaires and open-ended interviews in a really inductive manner, which means trying to make the least assumptions possible from the start in those interviews. We also approach the project with a constructivist mindset, which is the belief that people construct knowledge from experience and not just from hearing words. So I, as the artist, was actually fully immersed in all of the interviews, some of them taking place in a hospital, 
some in coffee shop or even in people's homes. And this was so valuable because I was able to witness patient and families in different environments where post-transplant management takes place and pick up understanding that went beyond the literal words that they said in the interviews. Of course, those literal words were also important. So thematic analysis was performed on these in an iterative fashion, which means picking out those common repeated themes in their answers. So our questions ended up resolving, revolving quite a bit around um, more bothersome aspects of life post-transplant, worries about the future. We wanted to ask about positives from their hospital experience. And then of course the media or communication or style preferences just to help guide our resource development. So these conversations with teens actually completely changed how I understood the teen post-transplant experience. You see, after doing my own initial research about the post-transplant guidelines, I assumed that the biggest concerns expressed by teens would be all the needles, so many doctor visits, having to be careful about germs, and especially the side effects of the medications, which some of them include hair loss, acne, and weight gain. A teenager's worst nightmare, I thought. Um, and the questionnaires that we developed were based on these supposed concerns, uh, which actually came straight from the resources that we previously had to support families. But to our surprise, patients often claim to be used to most aspects of the post-transplant lifestyle with really low levels of worry about the future. <clears throat> for example, um, most of the answers to the question, is there anything you're worried about for the future? Dating, kids, job, <clears throat> were no, no, not really, no, no. <laughs> when asked about uh, what different aspects of post-transplant life bothered them, the category being afraid that I could get sick again or die, got all of them said not at all in the answers. I think one left it blank, but all the rest said not at all. Um, the only thing they did express some concern or bother about was the being careful about certain things like foods and infections. Interestingly, in the open, so that was the questionnaires, but in the open-ended interviews, patients brought up a couple concerns that had been totally missing from the questionnaires because those two concerns are not currently reflected in our resources for families. So two big things were irritation with having to drink so much water. And second, their fiercest frustration in the interviews that came up was actually dealing with parent nagging. Now, it was interesting in interviews with healthcare providers, they confirmed that this could be an issue that parents of young transplant patients have to be the ones at the beginning governing the lifestyle of their child. And the big challenge, as Dr. Urschel mentioned, is helping teens transition into taking over that governing role and maintaining the appropriate lifestyle. So some teens, it turns out, rebel from the lifestyle simply because they see it as their parents' thing and want to resist what they interpret as helicopter parenting. So healthcare providers gave us more insight into this phenomenon. But what's interesting is comparing some of their answers to patient answers, there were still a few misconceptions there. Healthcare providers thought that feeling different from healthy kids and having to take medications every day were often bothersome to teen patients. When in reality, our patients reported that these elements were hardly bothersome at all. What was really valuable in these conversations is healthcare providers also specified these lifestyle and health choices that they thought patients really should understand and prioritize better. So things we should incorporate in our resource. And finally, our interviews with parents. So parents really accurately predicted that the being careful about certain things, food infections, was the most bad, bothersome category for their kids. Um, and they confirmed in the interviews the difficulty with drinking large amounts of water. But just like healthcare practitioners, they predicted that teens were a lot more bothered by the post-transplant lifestyle requirements than they really were. And parents also expressed frustration that their teens were not taking their disease seriously. They really hoped a graphic novel would be able to help their teen understand the consequences of their actions and give them some perspective. Now, when we asked about the positives of the transplant experience, healthcare providers emphasized the sense of normalcy at school, ability to travel, play sports. Parents reported a change in perspective, one mother noting, not taking life for granted. And another one said, we've learned what is actually important in life. We now collect memories, not things. And patients really enjoyed meeting new people, being able to do more than they could before, and simply being alive. So taking all of this into consideration, 
we were hearing these three voices from the interviews, that there were some important lifestyle details that patients needed to better embrace, that they maybe needed some better perspective, but also that teens had already heard all this and were really tired of being nagged about it. Interestingly, in the questionnaires, none of the patients reported liking to receive information through books. So we hypothesized that a graphic novel written as an information pamphlet or a cautionary tale could further irritate teens and be dismissed as nagging. So we determined that subtlety would be key to avoid the resistance to instructional texts. And we decided we were gonna write a story. So we had asked teen patients their favorite movies and the common themes were action and humor. So we jumped into developing a story that was adventurous and humorous and not preachy that could exist on its own as a good story, but still address the concerns emphasized by the parents and healthcare providers. So that was a big part of my job. I was a student in art and design at the time, and I benefited from a really beautiful partnership between fine arts professors at the U of A and the clinical transplant team. This is kind of how it worked together. So the clinical team took the lead in identifying potential patients, performing interviews, and then evaluating the resource at the end. And the arts team provided this artistic backup. They challenged my drawings. They made me redo sections that were inadequate. And the best overlap moment between these two groups was during the storyline development part where I did the actual writing, but the clinical transplant team ensured accuracy while the arts team ensured the story was compelling. So I'm pleased to present out of this partnership what ended up being a 45 page graphic novel called The Cure. Now I'd love to quickly flip through it, show you some of the artwork and point out how we incorporated aspects of transplant life and encouragements into the story. So the story takes place in Edmonton, 10 years in the future, when a scientist named Professor Brecken manages to mutate earthworms to live forever. The main character is a 16-year-old Alex Colby, who we find out has had a heart transplant when he was six. And early in the story, he's already experiencing conflict with his mom and her quite exaggerated nagging. Now, unfortunately, Professor Bracken's lab burns down and pretty soon all the plants in Edmonton and the surrounding farms start mysteriously dying. And it turns out that the immortal worms escape the fire and are destroying the soil. So for the rest of the story, the characters are fighting against this unseen enemy. And this was meant to be one of the more subtle lessons, suggesting a respect for a hidden disease, for a problem that may not be visible now, but has consequences. Anyways, in the hubbub, Professor Bracken disappears. Alex and his mom have another really big conflict. In their argument, Alex's mom goes on a rant where she mentions a bunch of the post-transplant guidelines, but really blowing them out of proportion. And this frustrates Alex enough that he decides to run away on a journey to find Professor Bracken and with her to try and save the city. Now, throughout the graphic novel, we really wanted to normalize the post-transplant lifestyle for teens. And here's a place where we're able to do that a little bit. In the montage of Alex sneaking out in the morning, his runaway bag actually includes the necessities like his medications, plenty of water, and then even some best practice items like bug spray and sunscreen. So even while he's rebelling, he's taking care of his health. Now through a series of events, he ends up finding the professor living in a cabin in the woods with a blooming greenhouse attached. And he's surprised that her plants are doing so well. And she explains this really goofy strategy that includes chickens and UV lights, but of course also includes excessive irrigation as a subtle elbow nudge to how much water teens have to drink regularity, regularly. And then she explains that even though it's an imperfect cure, it's still useful and beautiful. And this is a crucial theme throughout the book, responding to those parents' concerns that teens needed better perspective by subtly suggesting through the theme of an imperfect cure that health, even imperfect health, is worth fighting for. Now things get a little bit exciting. Alex and Professor Bracken accidentally uncover a sinister plot. They end up having to escape from a gun-waving enemy through a secret tunnel under Bracken's cabin. And some significant things happen in the tunnel. We discover that Bracken has had a heart transplant too, 
And so she becomes this mentor figure for Alex from this point on. And Alex is able to admit to her his frustrations with his mom, with the post-transplant lifestyle. And Bracken is able to directly speak into these things with a different voice than a parent or a healthcare provider. She speaks as someone who relates with his experience and from that place encourages him to take care of himself in the same way that she did. So her secret role in the story, Professor Bracken, is to effectively communicate to teens that it's health, not rebellion, that frees us to do what we want in life. And she sort of acts as living proof of this. Now, I don't want to spoil the rest of the story. There's some close calls, a plot twist, dramatic climax in a TV studio and a hopeful ending. Um, but there are a few key moments I want to point out. Near the end, Alex announces his idea to save Edmonton using Bracken's greenhouse technique on a citywide scale. And here Alex says something significant. He echoes what Bracken said before about it being an imperfect cure. And then he outright makes the connection to transplant life, pointing out that as someone with a heart transplant, he knows all about imperfect cures and that they are still worth it for the better life they give you. And at the very end, Bracken is dropping Alex off at home. And this is probably one of the least subtle parts in the story. But she says, my expert advice on dealing with nagging parents, beat him to it. And so when Alex's mom is about to nag him, he lists all these lifestyle requirements that he did follow that day and leaves her kind of speechless. She's nothing left to ask except if he wants a sandwich. We wanted to leave teens with a more overt strategy to suggest that they can beat nagging by taking ownership and making it their thing instead of their parents' thing. So that's the super abridged version of the story. As you may have noticed, rather than appealing too much to reason or evidence or consequence, we tried to use narrative and subtlety to slip our main messages into a more palatable package. And I do just want to acknowledge that a subtle approach does sacrifice the amount of detailed information that can be presented. So no teen is going to finish this book with a better understanding of how immunosuppressants work. But our goal was more of helping teens find an emotional or a positive relational connection with post-transplant care to help encourage and motivate them to take more ownership. A quick comment about the style that we chose. We did decide to leave the novel in black and white um, because when we compared different samples, to patients, they all picked different ones, color, not color. It was pretty even throughout. So we felt we had a free choice there. Um, and we liked the aesthetic of the black and white. We liked the clear communication and it's much cheaper to print. So since there was no difference in preference that we went for that. And the graphic novel has been printed. Um, feedback from peers and assessors so far has been quite positive. We are in the process of having it be more formally assessed by teen patients, as well as teens who have not experienced a heart transplant to assess if the story is of interest and encouraging to them. Um, but in the meantime, The Cure, it's currently being distributed to heart, uh, teen heart transplant patients by the Pete's cardiology team at the U of A now. So it's pretty exciting. Just coming back to our learning objectives, one of our big takeaways for today is remembering that when we're looking for possible strategies and interventions, the potential of bringing together different disciplines, like in this case, visual arts and clinical research in order to address complex problems. Multifaceted problem like this calls for a bit of a multifaceted solution. So I'm really grateful that Dr. Urschel took the chance with me when I was an undergrad art student interested in using my skills in a medical context um, and using that for to try and address this problem from a different angle. And we're not alone in, in trying this. Um, more and more research is showing the benefit of comic use in medical education. And so there's these large groups like Graphic Medicine who are creating these communities to inspire patients, families, medical students, doctors, other professionals to add their perspectives on a wide range of medical conditions. There's graphic novels right now on epilepsy, asthma, anorexia, cancer, brain tumors, Crohn's. Usually it's from the perspective of someone who's experienced the disease or a family member. Um, and most of these comics are for adults, um, but they really are creating a community of support. So within this community, our book kind of fills a niche left open between the fun, sort of simple um, comics or picture books for younger kids like uh, this this one your transplant adventure a kid's guide to organ transplant it's pretty it's a really cute story it's written by two social workers in Michigan and then these more intense 
um, graphic novels, really thought provoking, often quite dark, um, dealing about all sorts of topics that you'll find you know, connected with graphic medicine, um, like this one uh, called Stitches by David Small, uh, which are really important, but maybe might be a little bit dark for, um, uh, for teens or, or might deal with a little more adult content than for our young teens. So another one of the biggest takeaways uh, for today is the importance of incorporation of the target audience perspectives in the earliest part of resource development. It's really interesting when the patients express challenges and difficulties like parent nagging and drinking water that weren't even on the questionnaires, which had been based on the current supportive resources that we were giving families facing a transplant. It really showed that there were some areas of concern not totally addressed by the resources previously. And it was really important for us to realize that and to hear about what really was bothering patients before we started our resource development. And hopefully because of that, we were able to dodge some of teen resistance to instruction that we didn't know was there through that more subtle approach. So as our medical community really seems to be more embracing patient-centered healthcare, we hope that more medical research will be done in this manner, prioritizing the patient experience, exploring multidisciplinary approaches to difficult problems, and increasing partnership with professionals from other fields of research, like education, counseling, literature, technology studies, and of course, fine arts. So thank you very much for listening. It was a pleasure sharing this project with you. I think at this point, we can open it up to discussion and questions. Thank you, uh, Stephanie and, and Simon. That was really, uh, really amazing and, and interesting. I, I enjoyed the graphic novel when I read it, and I tried to, you know, think as a teenager would as I read it, which isn't a far leap for me. And I, it, it was great, uh, really great. Um, I am sure questions will trickle in through the chat, or feel free to put up your hands as they come. Um, there's a, a question from Kara Penny. Excellent and exciting work, uh, Stephanie and Simon. Are there plans to share this graphic novel with other peds transplant populations outside of heart, example, kidney or liver? Yeah, uh, so I, I wanted to acknowledge too that this was actually supported by the Story Foundation or by the Story Children's Hospital as a Quality Improvement Initiative um, with some of the some of the funding for it. And it was also actually funded through the ATI, I think, for your summer studentship or through weekly, I don't recall actually which one it was, but uh, nevertheless. <clears throat> so uh, Stephanie has gotten an ISSN uh, for it and we have a good number of pre-printed ones. So for our local population it would definitely be um, shareable. The key reason why we haven't shared it more broadly yet was that we're still collecting um, feedback from families, the siblings, the patients themselves. And while they all love the, the novel, they're not always super diligent with sending us the feedback sheets, the completed feedback sheets back. But uh, we were just going to look into that and then open it up. I was wondering, Stephanie, about that page that you have found there with, with these kind of, if that's an exchange source that you would want to consider as well. Uh, through the graphic medicine? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's such an interesting program. It's, it's um, the website, I can put it in the chat right away, but um, they really highlight graphic novels that have been written from a medical perspective or exploring different medical themes. It's a really good resource um, pointing people in that direction. If there's a, um, yeah, a medical condition that's reflected there already, they're, they're really powerful. I read a lot of them in my prep for this project. Um, they were quite powerful. It would be actually quite interesting to see the, the comments of, for example, kidney transplant teenagers, if they relate equally to it. Uh, although they're not in the same boat in terms of the underlying diagnosis and experience that uh, may very well be worth sharing. Uh, Anne in Helpin. Hi, thanks. This is such a great presentation. Um, I'm just wondering if, if you would mind, I, I'm, I'm not sure if this is an open access paper or not, because I, I know you just recently published that, but could I share this on the ASHI ha, uh, has a patient portal page? Would you mind if I shared a link to that there? And 
Um, is that uh, like, I'm not, I just guess I'm not sure if it's open access or not. Good question. Yeah, it's published by Pediatric mm -hmm. Transplantation. And I think, I think it does require um, subscription to the journal in order to see the full version. Um, but I think the abstract is available. Many okay. universities have it. And the other thing you can do is you can always um, link to the abstract and mention that every author is free to share their publications for personal use. So as long as it's not commercially okay. distributed, they can either apply, uh, can either uh, email us or email Stephanie, and then we can share okay. it. Um, that's the legitimate way of distribution. So yes, okay, I think I'll ask you. Good. Yeah. I'll ask you offline just to confirm the details because that is a page where like patients would be specifically looking for HLA or transplant related information. So um, I know you're not talking about HLA specifically, but you know, it's all important. You have to take your medicines. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I think um, I think it's an amazing project and yeah, just thinking of other ways to share it. Maybe the AST transplant community of practice as well would be interested. Great, thanks. Uh, there's a question from Patricia Gongola. Uh, do you think it is fe feasible to study whether the novel makes a difference for teens' health behaviors? Yes, we've been thinking about this a lot and how it would be really difficult <laughs> because it's hard to just identify, was it the graphic novel that made a difference or what, because it's such a multifaceted um, cause and problem. Um, yeah, do you have any other thoughts on that, Dr. Ashley? I know we chatted about it before and kind of left it to the side. And a lot of our a lot of our um, sort of validation process is looking at do teens really even enjoy it? Is this something interesting to them? Do they find this engaging? Do they feel encouraged? Yeah, I mean the patient numbers, first of all, <clears throat> are unlikely to be sufficient to to show an direct effect. And then there are so many factors that play into that in such a, such a heterogeneous group that it would be unlikely or it would be overly ambitious, I think, to expect that we can see, for example, more adherence after they received the novel than before or something like that. Like even with, with other similar studies where things like that were tried in larger patient groups, they always ran into the trouble that there's too many variable factors that play into it in a before and after situation. So that's why we specifically focus on their own impression. So we do have a couple of questions in our questionnaire where we say, do you feel you are more interested in learning more about your, your disease? Or have you learned anything new, which actually interestingly, most of the teenagers think they haven't learned much new, but they all liked it and they're all motivated actually to, to learn more about it. So maybe we've achieved our goal, although they feel, or maybe they haven't even picked up what they've learned, that that would be probably the ideal pathway. But yeah, I think objectivizing that would be unlikely to be successful in this um, setting and size of, a, of an assessment. It seemed, it seemed pretty clear from your assessment before the novel that um, the adolescents really care about the here and now, like the limitations of the transplants to their current life. Um, and so food and water and nagging were like the three things, right? Um, but they're less interested or, or less considerate of long-term ramifications of, of transplantation, including death even. Um, so it would be interesting to see whether or not that, that plays a more prominent role or whether it's part of sort of the immortality that comes with adolescence. Um, uh, Karen Johnson, there was a question from you first, and then there's a question from Deanna. Hi, I, I just want to say I think you did a fabulous job with the graphic novel, um, and I've done some work with adolescents who have diabetes as their chronic disease, and I really think you could use this as kind of like a group book club for adolescents as a um, way to start conversations, or even with parents to talk about some of the barriers that these kids are having and that they may not understand. And I know from diabetes, a lot of the kids would talk about, you know, the kids would walk in the door and instead of, hi, honey, how was your day? I'm so glad to see you. It was like, did you take your insulin? Did you test? Did you, did you, did you? And so it was all about that chronic disease and not about that family. And so I just think you have great opportunity for communication with us. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I, I do really agree that a lot of the themes that came out, it sounds are quite generalizable across these groups of 
teens who are experiencing chronic disease. So yeah, that's a fun idea, a book club um, of ex looking through, reading the graphic novel and then having discussions about, is that relatable for you? And, and yeah, thanks, that's a good idea. Um, from Deanna Toshak, uh, um, there's a, a, a comment or a question regarding um, response rates is what I understood, but I think I think um, Simon, you had sort of touched on it that that you were there was a bit of a struggle with getting feedback after the novel. Uh, Deanna, do you want to just unmute yourself and and sort of ask your question? Um, Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm actually working with Simon on the quality of life project and um, we're noticing we're having issues actually receiving responses back. So I was curious, Stephanie, um, if you had any um, strategies that have been successful for this project, like is there any incentive that you're using for this project um, or how that's going for you um, in terms of getting that feedback? Yeah, that's a great question. The most effective way of approaching it, I found, was doing it in person. So saying, hey, do you want to be part of this? Here's the book. We'll give you 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour to read it and fill out a uh, reflection about it afterwards. We'd love to either chat about it or just take the reflection back. And doing that in person was a lot more effective. So catching when patients were um, at the hospital for appointments was much more effective. And our plan had been to actually spend the next summer working on that. That summer ended up being COVID summer. And so our alternative solution was calling up uh, patients saying, hey, we'd love to send you this book. And then could you send back um, the, <laughs> the form? And that was much less effective. Lots of enthusiasm, but very little uh, forms actually returning to us. So I'd suggest the in-person strategy when possible. Great. Thank you. Yeah. If they see me the next time in clinic, then they remember that they still haven't sent it. Um, but yeah, it's as soon as they take it home, it becomes more difficult. But then of course, yeah, sometimes they have time enough to read it there or even read it together. Um, but but it is, it's been challenging to get the written feedback. Sure. Um, are there other questions from the group? I just have one quick question. Um, what about audio uh, book version of this? I know it's graphic novel, but I mean, you could do the version the visual, but as an online um, and have the audio portion of that too, just in case there's um, other teens that might have visual impairments or, or so forth. So I was just curious if there was other ways to do this for them. Yeah, I love that question um, because it explores accessibility and how do we make this yeah, an approachable resource for everyone. And we hadn't thought of that as of yet, but I think that's a really interesting idea. Thanks. Yeah, one of the questions we had asked as well is what, what media would they prefer? Expecting actually we would get more requests for electronic media and surprisingly not as much. And also in, in preparation to that, it was interesting to see that the good old comic book out of my own childhood seems to be very popular amongst that age group again. So, so but definitely other media will be a good way of sharing. Uh, Phil Halloran. And I just wanted to uh, say, as this is a very important uh, project, but it's also a very important issue in transplantation overall, this transition, uh, managing especially the adolescent and the transition. And so communications, I think the, your idea of communications is really, uh, really should be extended. Um, it's not just a, 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 an issue with the adolescents, because adolescence for many of these people continues on because of their health challenges. So um, I think you should um, should should use a broad brush in in applying this uh, to transplantation to see how we can reach many many young people. We may not be classifying them as as uh, adolescents anymore, but their behavior is. So I guess I'm my question is: um, Have you considered extending this uh, your scope? I think we should definitely validate it up to 25 years of age or so. And I think that was our inclusion criteria. Um, same as with the quality of life, because yeah, I 
even 25 is young, and I don't know that we're all reasonable adults by that age. Um, so, so I think that's a great idea. They may not relay as much to kind of the parental nagging and those aspects, but they may very well appreciate other aspects for it. That's very easy to just add a group of young adults um, for evaluation and see what comes back there. I think it's a great idea. Thank you. I think I'm, I'm thinking of the, uh, uh, the young male uh, who's often very difficult to reach. Um, and they may not fit into your category, but the young male is very, is often very immature preparation, especially with health problems. So I'm just thinking of, think about ways of extending your communication strategy to other areas where we've got uh, problems with, especially with younger people. So anyway, thank you for this. And that's a, a great segue to Patricia's question. Are there gender differences in how teens respond to the book? I don't think we have enough data to make any, draw any conclusions up there. I was surprised because like I said, I, I only have boys at home and I loved comic books and they love comic books more than anything. Um, and that's what I kind of assumed was a bit of a male trait. But I was surprised of how many females were really, really interested in the book and uh, amazed about it and gave very valuable feedback. Stephanie, from your interviews. Yeah, definitely. There was a lot of enthusiasm when I got to the section of my interview where I'd show a few samples of, of different types of artwork and ask them to choose which they found more interesting or or related to the most, there was a ton of enthusiasm um, in response to that So, uh, from the female patients. So that was really cool to see. Uh, I noticed in the chat, there's also a comment from uh, Norma Becker about how uh, it was interesting that parents and youth had commented on prioritizing the patient experience. And uh, Karen uh, Johnson included a link for um, to check out the Well on Your Way transition website uh, for youth to adult healthcare. Uh, thanks for that, guys. Are there any uh, other questions from the group? Uh, if not, um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Urschel and uh, Stephanie for a wonderful presentation, um, really informative and interesting. Uh, next Wednesday, we will be hosting Dr. Matthew McCauley presenting on Im immunomodulatory cyclics, uh, dampening immunity towards our own tissues and the registration link we put in the chat. Uh, thank you all. Uh